Okay, so today we'll be doing, we'll be continuing with our series on the, what the Buddha teaches, he calls the perceptions that lead to the deathless. And so today, the last time we did the perception of impermanence, the anicca sanya, and today we'll be doing the anatta sanya. So this is the perception of non-self, which is in a way the crux of the Buddha's teaching and also the most difficult thing, most difficult point to understand. And I'm not going to give a kind of formal lecture on anatta, trying to explain it in detail, but basically the point of the teaching of anatta is to remove, to obliterate the sense of selfhood, of I-ness that stamps itself or superimpose, that we superimpose upon our experience. So what the Buddha teaches is that experience is a kind of, I call it an integrally unified process involving a multiplicity of factors functioning together in unison. And these are categorized into various ways, most commonly into the five aggregates. But on because of our primordial ignorance, there arises on top of this flow or process of the five aggregates, the idea that behind our experience or within our experience, there is some kind of substantial I or self, some kind of lasting, solid, substantial basis for the sense of personal identity. And that sense of self becomes the driving force behind our grasping and clinging craving and so on. And so the thrust of the Buddha's practice of insight is to see into the non-self nature of phenomena, whether by way of the sense bases or the five aggregates. And this selfless nature of experience is really, it's the meaning of what is called emptiness, that phenomena are empty of any kind of any kind of self, of any truly existent I, of anything that can be claimed as being I or mine. And then I compiled a few texts just to give us some idea of the teaching of Anatta. I just did this quickly this morning, actually. And let me increase the size. Okay, so continuing, we were using the Giri Mananda Sutta for our understanding of these perceptions. And so here the Buddha raises the question, what is the perception of non-self? And then he speaks about a monk who's gone to the forest and so on. And then he reflects thus, the I is non-self, bodily forms, or actually this would be in this case, visible forms are non-self, the ear is non-self, sounds are non-self, similarly the nose, odors, tongue, taste, the body, tactile objects, the mind, and mental objects. So the six sense faculties and their corresponding objects are to be seen as non-self. And so that is called the perception of non-self But that also applies to this to the five aggregates. So some other sutta says bodily form is non-self, feeling is non-self, perception is non-self, the volitional activities are non-self, consciousness is non-self. Then the usual way of establishing the truth of the, or the reality of non-self is on the basis of the other two characteristics. So we begin with impermanence, so physical form or the body is impermanent. What is impermanent is in some way connected with suffering. Not that it's su suffering in itself, but it's bound up with suffering. And so what is impermanent, suffering and subject to change should not be regarded as this is mine, this I am, this is myself. 
So this is in regard to the first aggregate. And then the same applies to the aggregate of feeling, perception, the volitional activities, and consciousness. So all the five aggregates are impermanent, bound up with suffering, and so they should not be regarded as mine, this is what I am, this is myself. And thus all bodily form, feeling, and so forth, everything should be regarded as this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. Yeah, I think I'll come back to the emptiness one a little later. Okay, then the Buddha says like this is the contemplation, the kind of knowledge that leads to abandoning the asavas, the taints, to uprooting the taints, to abandoning the underlying tendencies to greed, aversion, and ignorance, for uprooting the underlying tendencies to greed, aversion, ignorance. So what is it? When one knows and sees the I is non-self, when one knows and sees visible forms is non-self, and so with the other sense faculties and their objects. And then, uh, yeah, so this is from the poem in the Sutta Nipata, in which a Brahma, uh, uh, an inquirer named Moga Raja asked the Buddha, how does one look upon the world so that one escapes the vision of the king of death? And then the Buddha says, look upon the world as empty, being ever mindful, having uprooted the view of self or the idea of self, one may cross over death. The king of death does not see one who looks upon the world in that way as being empty. And then we have the sutta where Ananda comes to the Buddha and says that you say that the world is empty, the world is empty. How, what is the reason why you say that the world is empty? And the Buddha says it is because it is empty of the self and of what belongs to self that we say that the world is empty. And what is empty of self and what belongs to self? The eye is empty of self and of what belongs to self. Visible forms are empty. Eye consciousness is empty. Eye contact is empty. Whatever feeling arises is empty, whether pleasant, painful, or neutral. So all the sense faculties, their objects, the corresponding types of consciousness and so on, all of that is empty of a self and of what belongs to self. So it's because on this basis that is said that the world is empty, empty of a self and of anything that belongs to a self that can be taken as being truly mine. Okay, so that's like a, <laughs> a five minute or seven minute overview of the teaching of non-self. But we want to put this into practice we're going to start with the walking meditation. And so I'm going to break the walking meditation into two phases, each of about 10 minutes, or say 12 minutes. The first phase, this is what you do. You start off from your, on your walking path, you know, in your room or hallway. So you take your starting position. But now we practice a little different from the way we usually do. First, you note the intention to take the right step. And then you take the right step, mindful of the right step. Then you pause for a split spec second and you note the intention to take the left step. And then mindfully, you take the left step. Then again, you pause for a split, spec, split second. Then you note the intention to take the right step. And then mindfully, you take the right step. And in this way, you proceed 
with the two phases, intention to take the step, and then mindfully taking the step. You don't have to break the step into stages, but just those two phases, the intention to take the step and the body taking the step. And then you walk this way till you get to the end of your walkway, whether it's 10 steps, 12 steps, whatever, then you note the intention to stop, then you stop walking, the intention to turn around, and then the steps of turning around, then the intention to pause for a moment, then you note that you're pausing, then the intention again to take the right step, and then you take right step, left step, and so on, back to the beginning point, and then you just continue walking till I sound the gong, and when you hear the gong, then you go back to your seats and then I'll explain the next phase in the walking meditation. Okay, so let's go and it'll be about 12 minutes. May I ask a question? Bob? Oh, please, yeah. Um, but only a purely practical question, not theoretical yes. question. Um, yes, um, so when you're putting the, when I'm putting the right foot down, my left foot automatically lifts up. So I kind of get confused. No, no. Keep it paused for a moment. Don't start picking up the left foot, but you hold yourself in that position until you've noted the intention to take the left step. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if there's any other practical question about the, the method you could ask. Okay, so then we'll proceed. Let me pause the recording. Okay, so now we're going to do the, the next step in the walking meditation. This is going to be a bit tricky. You try it and see if you can do it. So it's a rather, it can be a bit difficult. Okay, so what we just did, we had two aspects to the walking. One is you have the intention to take the step and then mindfully you take the step. Okay, now, Next phase, again, you still have the intention of taking the step. So intention to take right step. You mindfully take the right step, but in taking the right step, try to differentiate, to distinguish the body which is taking the step, that's the rupa, the bodily form, and the knowing of the body taking the step. So you have these two things going on simultaneously. The body itself is taking the step and the mind is knowing that the body is taking the step. So that's the right step and the left step. You're standing still just for that split second you have the intention to take the left step and you're taking the left step and in the left step you're aware of the body taking the step and the knowing going on that you are taking the left step it might not be exactly simultaneously because the mind is sort of alternating quickly between the actual body step, taking the step and the knowing of the step, but it can be like almost simultaneously. A little bit like an electric current where the current alternates very quickly between one pole and the other pole, but it occurs so quickly it gives the impression of a continuous light. Bunty, is that like a three-step process where you have the intention knowing the form is moving yeah right and then seeing it through the mind's eye exactly. is it something like that okay exactly. thank you and they quick question regarding the second step yeah you're seeing uh the second step so that we knowing the step that's a third but the second is the body taking the step yeah. the body taking the step can neither 
envision the only the foot taking the step instead of the body. Well, it's the body is part of the uh, the foot is part of the body. So it, what you're attending to is the whole body taking the step. Sometimes maybe the mind will focus, but you shouldn't just focus exclusively on the foot itself. But just you focus on the whole body, especially the leg taking the step. Okay, that's kind of hard. Thinking of the foot taking the step is easier, but the whole body yeah. taking the step is kind of hard. Wait, say again? I mean, uh, thinking of the foot taking the step is easy, but the body taking the step, meaning Whatever, whatever you find easier to do, you do. But what you're, you're, and maybe when I say three steps, it's a little misleading. There's really two steps. One is the volition, the or the intention, the intention to take the step. Then the <laughs> the intention to take the right step. Okay, then you're taking the right step. Well, while taking the right step, what you can do is distinguish, you differentiate the bodily form, which is walking, taking the step, and the mind knowing that you're taking the step. Okay, got you. Thank you, Bendy. Basically, it's a bodily form taking the step. Yeah. That, that, yeah. Okay, I got you. Thank you. Yeah. It's the body takes the step, but the mind is knowing that knowing. you're taking the step. Okay, got you. If, if Thank you, you find it difficult, don't worry about it. Just try your best. If it's too difficult, then you can just go back to the earlier um, method of intention taking the step. Intention taking the step. Monte, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, please. Uh, this is David. Um, so when after i form the intention to walk then the default brain mode takes over and it's you know and and uh, uh you know i don't see any intentionality in terms of the next step you know because my brain is operating on automatic at that point i mean i can feel the lifting the moving i can you know uh feel the you know the intention to stop but in between time it's like driving a car when suddenly you're yeah, there yeah yeah. Don't try to notice intention while taking while you're actually in the process of taking the step. Okay, so is it best just to stop, you know, and then and notice the intention and then take the step? Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. Okay. You're okay. you're you're in the pause mode. You really have to interrupt that. Yeah. Yeah. Then you note the intention, say right step, then you take the right step, and in taking the right step. You look very closely and you can distinguish the bodily form, which is moving, taking the step, and the mind knowing that the body is taking that step. Got it. Thank you, Bhante. Okay, so let's try this. Maybe we'll try about 10 minutes, and then we'll go to this back to the sitting, sitting position. Yeah, and maybe I should explain what's going on here theoretical, sort of at the theoretical level. We're sort of breaking the act of walking down into aggregates, seeing it in terms of the aggregate. So the bodily form or the body which is taking the step is, of course, the aggregate of rupa, of bodily form. The intention to take the step belongs to the sankara kanda the aggregate of volitional activities, since that's the intention is a volition. And then the knowing of the step involves, let's say, the mutual functioning of the sanya kanda, the aggregate of perception, and the vijnana kanda, the aggregate of consciousness. We don't have to try to distinguish perception and consciousness at this point, but just take them together as the mind knowing, the activity of knowing. So we have bodily form, volition, and knowing. Okay, so let us do the walk for about 10 minutes, then I'll sound the gong. Yeah, that practice might have been that it's 
always a bit difficult at the beginning. It's something that you have to get used to through regular practice. And I have to say, usually I can only do that practice when I'm in the retreat mode, continuing after several days, then the mindfulness becomes sharp and subtle enough to do it. But I thought it would be an interesting experiment for us to do today. It was great, Pante. It's a oh, good, good training okay. of the mind. It was so yeah. difficult, but it, it's a good training of the yeah. mind. Yeah. Thank you. So what is happening is that we are turning. Usually we think, I am walking. And so we're positing, even in a subtle way, a kind of self, maybe not theoretically, but just in an ordinary psychological way. We have a sense of like there's a self that's doing the walking. But now when we slow down and do it in this very mindful way, with this analysis, we see that the act of walking involves the volition, the intention to take the step. So that's a factor from the aggregate of volitional activities. Then there's the rupa, the bodily form, which is the body doing the walking. And then the knowing of the walking involves the let's say the coordinated operation of perception, consciousness. And since we're doing it mindfully, there's also clear comprehension or sampajanya. So all of those factors are working together. And when they work together, then we sort of artificially superimpose the idea of I over the act of walking. Okay, now let us do like a short period of sitting meditation. Oh, somebody says I had the same experience slowly. Let me see what that is. Slowly and focusing makes the walk lose balance. In that case, you're probably walking maybe too slowly and you could speed up the walking a little bit or <laughs> try to use extra mindfulness to maintain your balance. Yeah, it is a challenge to walk slowly like that while maintaining the balance, but it's something that you develop, a skill that you develop through practice. Okay, so let us do the sitting meditation to develop what we call the anatta sanya, the perception of non-self. And we shouldn't think that we're gaining the deep insight into non-self, but this is a preliminary way of developing the reflection on non-self, a way to prepare the mind for the actual insight into non-self, which inv almost invariably takes place in a process of deep meditation. Okay, so you take your regular meditation sitting position. And then after the walking, you could settle the mind with a few rounds of mindful breathing. Okay, first we're going to do the perception of non-self in regard to the sense modalities. And then we'll do it with, in relation to the five aggregates. And so this is a kind of practice that involves reflection, reflective thought. Okay, so the I, that is the organ of vision, the eye in that sense, is not mine. It is not I, not myself. Visible objects are not mine. 
not I, not myself. When vis visible objects strike on the eye faculty, there arises eye consciousness with the function of seeing. That eye consciousness is not mine, not I. not myself. It is just the mental act with the function of seeing forms through the eye faculty. So all of them together, the eye faculty, visible forms, I consciousness are not mine, not an I, not myself. The air faculty is not mine. Not I, not myself. It's merely an organ with the ability to receive sounds. Sounds are not mine. They don't point to an I. They're not myself. When sounds strike on the ear faculty, there arises ear consciousness with the function of hearing. The ear consciousness is not mine, not an I, not myself. It is just a mental event with the function of hearing sounds. So the ear sounds and ear consciousness together, all of them are not mine, not I, not, not an I, not myself. I'm going to do it in a bit compressed form so we could fit everything in. If you're doing it on your own and you have more time, you'll do the full, um, the, the full reflection. So the nose is not mine, not I, not myself. Tongue is not mine, not I, not myself. The body faculty is not mine. Not I, 
not myself. The mind faculty is not mine, not an I, not myself. Mental objects, ideas, perceptions, concepts, thought formations, and so on, are not mine, not I, not myself. When a mental object enters into the mind stream and the mind faculty picks it up, then there arises mind consciousness with the function of knowing the mind object. That mind consciousness too is not mine, not I, not myself. Thus the mind faculty, the mental objects and mind consciousness together are not mine, not I, not myself. So taking them collectively, the six sense faculties, eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. The six respective objects, visible forms, sounds, odors, taste, tactile objects, and mental objects, and the six types of consciousness, consciousness through the eye, through the ear, through the nose, through the tongue, through the body, through the mind organ, all of these together are not mine, not I, not myself. So that's a very quick tour through the perception of non-self using the 12 sense bases or the 18 elements for contemplation. Then we could do it through the five aggregates if you're doing it on your own, you'll choose one or the other, either the sense bases or the aggregates. Usually we don't do together because it too, becomes too complicated. But let's just go through the aggregates. Okay, so t first we take the aggregate of bodily form, physical form, this body. This body is not mine, not I, not myself. And you can reflect to some reflections to sort of substantiate that this, that this body is formed through the union of sperm and egg from father and mother. It's sort of governed by the genetic code going back probably billions of years to the origin of life on earth. The body is sustained by food, water, and air. So dependent, utterly dependent on supporting conditions. So the body is not mine, 
not I, not myself. And feeling the felt tone of experience, the sensations, bodily sensations, pleasant, painful, neutral, are not mine, not I, not myself. And the aggregate of perceptions, which includes con concept formation, uh, idea formation, construction of designations and so on, all perceptions and ideas are not mine, not I, not myself. Then we take the aggregate of volitional activities, our intentions, plans, aims, purposes, various actions, All these volitional activities are not mine, not I, not myself. And then we take the subtlest aggregate, the aggregate of consciousness, the bare awareness that arises based on the faculties of eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and the mind organ. So this consciousness is not mine, not I, not myself. So these five aggregates together are empty of anything that, of any self and of anything belonging to a self. Just five aggregates functioning together giving rise to the delusion or illusion of a self, of a true I, but in themselves empty of a real, truly existent I or self. You could just dwell for a minute or two if a sense of sort of the emptiness of the five aggregates arises. Just settle into that for a minute or two.
Okay, you can take now a couple of mindful breaths in and out. In and out. Okay, and then you can open your eyes. <laughs> I should say, open the eyes. <laughs> and if there are any sort of practical questions, I'll take a few practical questions. I don't want to go into theoretical questions of non-self, but let's see. Okay, first we have Samangi. Mona, yes. Mona yeah. It's me. Thank you. Um, so when you were talking about not mine, not I, not myself, yeah. all the uh, physical things, I, nose, uh, ear, I can um, follow that. But when you say mind is not mine, yeah. I have a hard time differentiating between the mind and consciousness, because when I say mind, not mind, what exactly is that mind that I'm saying not to? Yeah, this is all, I always have to say that this is a little bit problematic, but it seems that Buddhism posits a kind of faculty of, let's say, of thinking, of entertaining ideas, concepts, and so on, and the knowing of those ideas, concepts, and so on. So that which does the thinking of the ideas is the mind faculty, and the knowing of those ideas, concepts, and so on is the mind consciousness. Yeah, it's really difficult to, to, to distinguish them, but I think we just have to make a kind of theoretical distinction. Though in actual practice, it takes a lot of um, attention or mindfulness to be able to distinguish between the two. Would it help if I say what I used to think some years ago, I don't think now, so it cannot be. It cannot be what? It cannot be myself because um, uh, what I used to think say 10 years ago, um, it's not the same as I think now, so that thinking cannot be mine in some yeah. way. Yeah. Into yeah, that's a good way. There are many sort of approaches that you could take to sort of un undermine or weaken that sense of self. Okay, thank you. Okay, Mariam. Thank you, Bonte. I wanted to see if I'm thinking is correct or not with regard to the mind and the brain, basically. As the, you were talking about what? brain. Yeah, go on. So I was, I, as you were describing like the consciousness of the eyes yeah. and the nose, the, fa the faculty of the nose, the job is to smell, yeah. the faculty of the ears is to hear yeah. things. Yeah. And I've always had a problem with the brain. And when you said mind, I kind of felt like, wait a minute, can I think of the faculty of the brain is the mind? Yeah, actually, technically in the Buddha system, the, what we call the mind faculty is not identified with the brain. <laughs> in fact, I have to say the Buddhist texts don't recognize the function of the brain. Of course, they, they acknowledge the existence of the brain, but <laughs> the, the, <laughs> The, the actual functioning of the brain in relation to knowing and consciousness, I think was only discovered in Europe in the 18th century. <laughs> so the Buddhist texts don't show an awareness of the function of the brain. Um, okay. So they don't identify, but they, they speak about the something called the heart, heart base as the physical organ, which is the base of consciousness. But when we're doing okay. the contemplation of non-self, we don't bring in the heart base. Okay, so I mean, what I was thinking, was, yeah. I, sh I yeah. should just put it aside. I shouldn't yeah. think about the yeah. brain of yeah. anything yeah. related to this. Okay. Yeah, for now, don't. Yeah. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, Samantha. Thank you, Bante. Um, I just want to uh, clarify, is the, um, 
um, the five other five aggregates, the same as the Nama Rupa in the dependent origination. You know, you got Vijnana yeah. and you got the Nama Rupa. Yeah. Um, I was trying to put all this into like a cause and effect um, sort of situation. So, yeah, so that's where I was getting confused. Is there, is there five aggregates the same as Nama Rupa? We could say that in the formula of dependent origination, we have Vijnana and Nama Rupa. So vijnana will be the aggregate of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then in nama rupa, the rupa component is the same as the rupa aggregate. And then the nama in nama rupa, the way it's specified in the sutta, it includes perception or feeling, perception and volition, which correspond to the middle three aggregates. It also includes attention and contact which could, we could put in the aggregate of volitional activities. Yeah, so we could say that vijnana and nama rupa together comprise the five aggregates. Yeah, because I've heard of like rupa, vedana, sanya, manasikara, and chetana. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. would that be the dependent origination, the nama? The, the yeah. nama? yeah. Right. Because, and then you've got the vijnana, two lots of vijnanas you got the vijnana the third link and then you got the nama in the nama rupa so are yeah, they but in in the formula for dependent origination nama doesn't include vijnana mm -hmm. but um in explaining the way of developing insight when they speak about the discernment of nama rupa then nama is taken to include all four mental aggregates so there are different contexts. In the context of dependent origination, vijnana is taken out of nama and made a separate link, probably because it's the condition for the arising of a new existence. Yeah, but now we're getting theoretical. So I just wanted really to take practical questions. Thanks, Bhante. That clarified. For, anyway, thank yeah. you. Okay, so we'll just take one more question. This will be Rina. Yeah. Um, so should I think that all my inten all intentions and actions and resulting karma, including unwholesome karmas, are not not mine? Uh, say again. Uh, so if all intentions, intentions and actions are not mine, yeah, then all resulting karmas are also not mine. Like any bad unwholesome karma is also not mine. Yeah, from that standpoint of of the perception of non-self, even the wholesome volitions, unwholesome volitions, wholesome karma, unwholesome karma are not, not mine, not I, not myself. But so then how do I take responsibility? So it doesn't mean I, I take no responsibility for but uh, from a, of... that's from a yeah, they're like different frameworks. From the karmic framework, you have to take responsibility from for your karma. So in that sense, the Buddha says, you have to recognize karma is yours. You are responsible for your karma. You are the one who creates your karma. So in that sense, the Buddha, in a sense, he's bringing in a provisional idea of self just to, as the basis for moral responsibility. But in a different framework, this is a framework of developing insight in order to gain liberation then one contemplates all the factors of one's being, all the five aggregates, including volition or intention as non-self. May I elaborate a little bit on that question? Uh, Excuse me? May I elaborate a little bit on that last question? Um, yeah, actually that would require too much explanation. Okay, and, okay. and now I've reached a point where I have to break for the lunch. Okay, thank you. Yeah, somebody has a question. Memory seems to be a strong component in creating a sense of self. Is memory stored in the brain? Interestingly, the question of memory is not really addressed within the suttas. And no, the question never comes up where are memories stored? How are they stored? But it's just said that when we develop a very strong samadhi, one can recollect even events from previous lives. 
And through mindfulness, it's said that one develops this, a, a very strong capacity for, for memory. But the question is never comes up, where is memory stored? It's just maybe considered too theoretical a question. Okay, so let me end the session with the sharing of the merits brief, very quickly. Akasa tacha bhuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anamoditva chirang rakantu sasanang. Akasa tacha bhuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anamoditva chirang rakantu desanang. Akasa tacha bhuma ta Deva Naga Mahidika Punyantang Anomoditva Chirang Rakantu Mang Parang Dukha Pata Chani Dukha Paya Pata Chani Paya Soka Pata Chani Soka Antu Sabepi Pani No May those in suffering be free from suffering May those in fear be free from fear May those in sorrow be free from sorrow May all living beings also be thus. And then we end with three three vows. Sadhu, 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 Thank you. Thank you, Bhante. And about to Bhante. Thank you, 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 Bhante.